Welcome to the Happy Black Woman Podcast, where we're on a mission to empower women to transform their lives through personal development and entrepreneurship. We bring you all the information, inspiration, and motivation you need to create a life of happiness, success, and freedom. Now, please welcome your host, the happy black woman herself, Rosetta Thurman. Hello, happy black women. It's Rosetta, and you are listening to another episode of the Happy Black Woman podcast. I'm so excited to have you joining me and with a very special guest that many of you may know of, and I just learned of her. Her name is Christia Donaldson, and she is the founder of Thank God It's Natural. I think she is only the second natural hair company founder I've had on the show, so I am super pumped to uh, ask her some questions that you all may have about starting a product-based business and being successful in that industry. So welcome, Christia. Thank you, Rosetta, for having me on the air. I am very glad that we were able to get you on. And also, we're talking before we started recording about how we connected. And it's just that we both have really great teams (laughs) that brought us together. Yeah, that's critical. (laughs) Critical. You know, so we're always looking for great guests. And so obviously, want people who can bring not just great content and inspiration, but also a story of success that we can learn from. So very cool to have you on the show. And just for those who have not heard of Thank God It's Natural. Tell us a little bit about what it is. I'm probably one of the few who don't know about it, honestly, because I don't know about a lot of natural products. I have natural hair, but I just been using the same stuff (laughs) over and over again since I went natural. So Christia, what is Thank God It's Natural all about? So thank God it's natural. We're a manufacturer of textured hair care products for a kinky, curly, and wavy hair. We got our start back in 2009 with a book called Thank God I'm Natural, which basically chronicled my journey going natural and the research that I found assisting women making this transition as well as caring for their natural hair. And then in 2013, we launched a line of products called TGIN, or Thank God It's Natural, that delivers on the promises of helping women to achieve softer, moisturized, more manageable hair. And today, we're in close to over 5,000 stores, including Target, CVS, Walgreens, Whole Foods, and Sally Beauty Supply. Beautiful. I love it. I think back to my own natural journey of how I went natural. And there was, you know, I didn't even know that there would be a book I could go and get about it. Back then, I went natural end of 2009. And I tried all these different things. And finally, I just said, I'm going to cut it all off and start, you know, from scratch. And I tried all these products. And eventually I was like, I'm just going to do coconut oil and water. That's been mostly what I've been using for all these years. But now that all these products are coming out, I'm starting to get more aware of all the different things that there are for our hair. And so tell us a little bit about the kinds of products that your company sells. So we sell everything from shampoo and conditioner to deep conditioners to stylers, such as moisturizing styling gels, buttercream daily moisturizers, and twist and define creams, all with the aim of helping women with, like I said, particularly women with dry hair or kinkier hair, achieve a look that's kind of polished or professional or what have you. And so that's kind of the game that we're in. We only, like I said, Three promises, softer, moisturized, more manageable hair. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, I am always so curious to know the story behind it. What made you launch this company based on natural hair care products? So it's interesting. I went natural just because I felt it in my intuition around 2003 that there was something wrong with me putting chemicals on my head. I was in law school at the time and I started growing out my relaxer. My hair was so much healthier. It wasn't breaking. It was growing. It was thriving. It felt thicker. And the problem was I did the big chop right before I graduated from law school. And I was starting work in corporate America at a large law firm, the one where Barack and Michelle Obama met. And at the time, there were not a lot of products that were really commercially available, like at your local, like CVS or Walgreens. And so I basically was like, I need to fix this, not only for myself, but for other women. And Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how the story goes. Added to that was the fact that when I was in corporate America, I felt that straight hair was, you know, put upon black women to wear their hair in that state. And I opted to wear a wig for like two years 
thinking that that would help me advance in the workplace. And it was the furthest thing from such. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of, yeah, what prompted me to start the product line is that my own issue with hair and looking a certain way in the workplace. I wanted to wear my hair kinky, curly, what have you, but there wasn't a lot of options out there back then. Yeah. I mean, back then, if you're talking 2003, I'm like, when you, we go to CBS, there's like the black gel and then right. like, <laughs> and blue magic and maybe some pink <laughs> lotion. And that was not necessarily cutting it. So, yes. I remember yeah. my pink lotion days. Yeah. Yeah. You know, our hair journey is so complex and beautiful as we talk about it. And, you know, a lot of people who come into our Happy Black Woman tribe, our events, they come in and they're like, look at all these beautiful natural hair sisters. And Happy Black Woman is not a natural community, but it's just that I think a lot of times when women, Black women get liberated in their mindset that they can wear their hair any way they want, they choose to wear it in a lot of these natural styles. And of course, you could choose to wear it straight or whatever. But when we get clear that we have a choice and we don't have to do what other people think we should do with our hair, a lot of us choose, you know, to be natural. So I think that's why we have so many (laughs) women in our Happy Black Woman tribe who are natural. I love it. Yeah. And I love what you said about wearing a wig and, you know, it didn't work for you like you thought it would because it probably wasn't authentic to you. Now you're out here, you know, being natural and helping other women do the same thing. What was it that prompted you? You said that, you know, there was a book that came out. When did the book come out? And then how long was it after the book that your company was launched? So the book was basically, I would consider the launch of the company came out in 2009. I had worked on the book for about a good three years and I self-published it at a time where self-publishing was just kind of taking off. And yes, that was, like I said, the impetus for, for the company starting was the book. We were going on all these book tours around the country around the time that Chris Rock's movie, Good Hair came out. Mm -hmm. And as a result of talking to all these women at various like book fairs, hair shows, churches, libraries, what have you, there was really a demand for what's next. Where do we go from here with the company? And that's how I started the products. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, there's so much that goes into building a company like this, not to mention, I mean, for everyone listening, a lot of a lot of you are thinking, wow, I'd love to write a book about my natural hair journey or my journey to really having power when it comes to my hair. But there's so much that went into just the book. And there was a lot that goes into building a product-based business. So give us some insight into what is involved or what was involved in getting this company off the ground and actually starting to sell products. Oh my God. To get into your first store. Tell us what was involved <laughs> before you even and got getting there. into stores yeah. or, or launching the product? Launching the product. Like I always consider your launch being like, okay, you launched and you started selling the thing. So what was involved with that process? So as it relates to the launch, I'm a lawyer by background. I wasn't a chemist. So I had to get out of my own way in terms of my fears around not having the skill set to step out and do something different than what I was formally trained to do. So first I had to get rid of the mental blockage. And that took some time. I was, you know, really fearful that I did not have what it took to start a hair care products company because I had no experience in the industry. Mm -hmm. And so I got out of my way, did a lot of research, talked to people in the industry. And eventually, the more people I talked to, the closer I got to finding the people who assist me with formulating and manufacturing our products. And in terms of getting into stores, we built, like I said, a real grassroots community, which even to this day is very important. The word of mouth, the mothers, the sisters, the mm-hmm. daughters, the coworkers, the best friend who've all told people about TGIN. That's come either from meeting us at events, interacting with us online, purchasing our products on a whim on Amazon or on the website, or just like me speaking at various different places. And so it's been 10 years in the game of just relationships, forming Mm -hmm. these relationships and nurturing them and doing our best by our customers to make sure we put out a quality product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love what you said about, you know, getting out of your own way, because if you've never done it before, how do you even know the steps that it would take? I mean, the biggest barrier to the women in our tribe who want to start a product-based business is how do you create the product? How do you get someone to manufacture the product? So can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Sure. So in terms of manufacturing a product, a lot of people start off in their kitchen and we did that. 
as well. I started off making some things myself based on kind of my own experimentation and research on the internet. And then there's a point where you kind of say, okay, I think I want to scale this and just finding a facility to assist you with that. That again, just comes from relationships and doing your research and possibly going to different trade shows and talking to people. People make introductions to you and you go from there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, getting pretty much starting on your own and it sounds like maybe you did some things to create something that could be scalable. I mean, getting to that point is also a challenge for a lot of people. So how many iterations would you say that you went through before you felt like, okay, this is it? Probably for the first two products, about maybe 18 iterations. I was super, super picky. I was like, this is what we're starting with. Social media was just starting to really be a significant piece in people's lives. And so in the days in the past, you could have a bad product, put it out there. But the only thing that if it was bad could hurt you was word of mouth. But with social media, the feedback would be instantaneous. And so I really, really went out of my way to make sure that what we came out with initially was something I could be proud of and could stand behind. Mm -hmm. Great. So who was the first store that started to carry your products? So it was a little store. We started with a line of body products. It was a little store in Chicago called Bon Sante in High Park. That's where Obama's from, mm -hmm. um, right literally down the street from where the Obamas live. And they took a chance on us. I came into the store with some samples and some information, which considering how our stuff looks now, would have, it looks way, even way more professional. But they were impressed by the presentation, mm -hmm. the packaging, what have you. And they said, hey, bring it in. We'll, we'll order. Mm -hmm. Now, is that where you're from, Chicago? I'm actually from Detroit. Okay, cool. Yes, but I've called Chicago home for 13 years. Oh, so. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. I love Chicago in the summer. Yeah, <laughs> it's beautiful nice in the summer. summer, but we have 40 <laughs> degree weather now. So I'm like, Whoa. yeah, it's kind of like the best winter ever. You can get you can get caught up. It's like, wow, this is a great place to move to. Yeah, right? and then winter comes and yeah. you're like, what did I do? Right, but everyone who's you know from there, they say, you know, you take the good with the bad. But yeah, it's a cool city. And so when you say that you actually, you know, took your product around, like, did you have a list of places? Like you went from Detroit and did you just like start with the big cities and start going to talk to people in different shops? How did you even get to that place? We were just, I was already based in Chicago, so I said, let's focus here. And there was enough places here that had not heard of us, so that I just focused here. I just mm -hmm. focused on the city where I was and saw what I could do to kind of get the word out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's just such a simple way to get started for everyone listening. You know, if you hear the strategy from what Christy is sharing with us, that is to start where you are and to take your product around until someone says yes, you know? Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, not to make you go back to, you know, that time, but you know, how many stores did you go to before the first one said yes? Well, the first one we went to said yes. So, wow. you know, we just came with our A game. So yeah. luck would have it. Yeah. You never know. You never know until you get out there. That's a great story. Awesome. Well, you know, I'm very conscious of the people who are listening and they're like, okay, this is sounding pretty cool. I'm already inspired. What would three tips be from you that you would have for the ladies who want to build product-based businesses? You know, as you were getting started, what you've learned over time probably has to do with obviously the marketing, the product, your own mindset. What would be the three top things you would share with someone who's listening and wants to have her own product-based empire? Well, the first, I think I have four, but the first would be, as I touched on earlier, it's important just to start. And I really think my background reveals that you don't have to have everything you think you need to venture into an industry. Like I said, I was a transactional lawyer for a software company mm -hmm. and I ended up doing hair care just because yeah. I was like, okay, I can do the research and I can put the hard work in and I can build the relationships to get me what I need. In any business, you're going to need relationships. So whether you're a, a nurse today, you have relationships with your patients, you want to open like a flower company or a, a catering business, you're going to need relationships there. Relationships are really what 
is most important. And like I said, that's critical to just getting started. Then the second thing is I would tell people if you can and you have good credit, use other people's money to get your business started. I know a lot of times people are like, I don't want to take on any debt. I don't want to owe anyone. The point is from a business standpoint, I'm trying to be succinct. That's what rich white people do. They use other people's money to get their companies Mm -hmm. off the ground. Let's just call it what it is. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's what they do. They don't put up their own money. They just don't. And so as black people, if you have good credit, I'm not saying go out and take out a hundred thousand dollar loan. But the point is, if your business goes belly up, it's better that you don't deplete your cash savings and that you owe Amex or whoever money versus not having anything for a rainy day. Yeah. And then the third thing I would say is focus on the little things. Like I never knew we would take off so quickly, but when you really do take off as a company, if the little things are not in place, when things become really chaotic and hectic, it'll be like, you don't have time to work on the little things. So the little things have to be airtight from the very beginning. And then finally, when you are at a point where you can hire people, make sure you hire good people. It makes a huge difference in terms of your business's growth and your ability to be successful. Yes, those are all amazing tips. And I want to go back to the piece about capital for your business, because this is something that we don't talk about a whole lot in our tribe, but I want to talk about it more because it's one of the barriers that Black women have to starting their businesses. There was a study that came out, was it last year or two years ago, that said that Black women are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs. And yet we struggle with getting capital for our business. And you know, to me, I'm like, well, there's money everywhere. There's money. This country was based on entrepreneurship and capitalism and all that. So there's money, but how come we're not finding it? So can you just share a little bit about a little bit more about what you said of using other people's money? Are you talking about getting a business credit card or applying for loans or or what are you saying? So there's a lot of moving pieces to this one. A lot of times people want to just quit their jobs and focus on the business. You don't quit your job and start a business. You work the business and then quit your job. I've been at my company, meaning Oracle, for 10 years, and I literally just gave notice two weeks ago, even though our company is in 5,000 stores. So I tried Congratulations. Thank you. (laughs) I appreciate it. I tried to make sure that the business could take care of itself and that the money I could make on the side that it took care of me. Also, I'll point out this. This is something I wish someone would have told me. When I quit my job, my boss was basically like, hey, you know, really happy for you. But if you ever want to come back and work as a contractor, you know, four times a year when we're busy, let me know. I wish two years ago I would have been brave enough or had the ideal of going to my boss and saying, hey, is there a part-time arrangement we can work out? And I don't really think that, comes up in the conversation a lot when you talk about people having a side hustle. It's like we put this pressure on ourselves to, okay, I'm going to have this 40-hour a week job and then I'm going to have this business that I do at night. I think that needs to be raised a lot more that, hey, if you really want to do the business, see if you can go part-time at your job and do it as a contractor and do your business. So that's another piece of it. Another thing around raising capital is why it's important not to quit your job is because banks often, when making line of credit decisions, will look to your Mm W-2s to see how much money you're making. So if you want to quit your job, get the line of credit or bank loan first, then quit. You have a hard time getting money from any financial institution if your business is not bringing in any money Mm -hmm. and you don't have a job itself to kind of be used as recourse. And then there is also the notion, again, of relationships. And like I said, For us, that can be challenging raising money because sometimes the venture capitalists and the private equity people are more driven to invest in companies of people who they have relationships with or people that look like them. And that is a problem because black women are not significantly represented in those spaces. And so those are all of the kind of things that are at play. But the important thing is to be strategic and not be reflexive and literally see if you can go as long as you can at your day job before for quitting for all the reasons I just described. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And one piece we didn't mention was, you know, how you're using your, your business is funding a lot of the investments that you need to make 
in your business that maybe aren't covered by a line of credit or whatever it is, you know, the, all the travel that you have to do to network and, you know, all those different things that are required. Oh, I love this. This is a great conversation about really what it takes to put your dream out there. And so knowing that you've built your company to this level and you're just now quitting your job, I am super curious to know how you managed to do both and get to the level of success that you've had. Tell us what has helped you stay focused and productive in this journey. What are some tools or things that you've done? That's a great question. So in terms of being able to juggle both, I had a great team of stay-at-home moms that I found on a website called Hire My Mom who were looking for part-time work but still doing something very challenging. These are people who used to work in corporate America, if you will, that just wanted to stay at home and have a a job, make some extra money, but the flexibility to spend with their kids. And I realized it's better for me to pay these individuals $15 an hour and for me to keep making whatever I was making an hour Mm -hmm. and have them do, because so much of starting a business is the little tedious details, the phone calls, the paperwork, what have you. I was like, if I can outsource this, and have them take care of that and me review it, then we can keep this thing going and I don't have to be in the trenches, not bringing in any revenue, doing pretty much administrative tasks. The first 18 months or 24 months of any company, there's gonna be a huge amount of administrative paperwork that is not revenue generating. And so I use that to help me juggle the company. And then in terms of, meaning the company with my full-time job, And then in terms of staying focused, now that I've reached kind of a certain level of being in business, I've hired a coach, if you will, and joined a CEO peer group with other individuals who are not in my industry. Mm -hmm. Because I learned, again, if we're talking to happy Black women, not just the ones who are starting businesses, but one day may find themselves at a certain level in the business community. I started talking to more and more white men and found out part of their success, they attribute it to these CEO peer groups, meaning like there are groups that are focused on helping CEOs of various companies that have certain amount of revenues problem solve, think analytically. Once a month, you meet with your group of 10 to 15 people and you work through an issue that one person's company is facing. And then you get to process how people would solve that problem, but you also get this informal network that can assist you offline or outside of meetings. In addition, that type of relationship or group comes with a facilitator who you have coaching sessions with on a one-on-one basis, 90 minutes a month. And so with that, I use those coaching sessions now to just help me think about how to work on the business strategically from a working on the business versus working in the business. And that's the goal any business owner should have is not to be in the weeds, but actually get to the point of one day saying, I'm working on my business. I'm not working in my business. Mm -hmm. Those are great strategies, two very actionable strategies. Number one, get help, hire a team, and it doesn't have to be expensive. You could use the resource hiremymom.com. We'll put these resources in the show notes as well. So you guys can find them on the website. And also, you know, interns, you know, a lot of, a lot of our ladies have teenage kids who know how to use social media, you know, so yeah, put them to work because they're definitely going to benefit from the revenue of your business. So they might as well, you know, <laughs> put some time in. And then the other thing you said was about the coaching. I, you know, now have a leadership coach and it's so great to have someone who's not in my industry of what I'm doing to challenge me and to help me think bigger because it's it's not good for you to be the the one in the room that's the smartest in the room and also the one making the most money because how are you going to learn? How did you find your leadership coach and what do you guys work on? So I am in a a formal mastermind program led by Lisa Sasevich. She's a business mentor. And so it's through her mastermind that I found my leadership coach. So she's one of her coaches. And I said, yeah, I need to focus on, I know how to make money, (laughs) you know, and that's not the issue. Now I just need someone to help take me to the next level in my leadership. And so when we talk, we talk about, you know, how can I step into greater leadership when it comes to managing my team and growing my team and focusing the business on growth and not just, you know, maintenance. I like it. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, definitely. We, especially for those of us who are high achievers, we need someone who's going to challenge us. And I'm like, oh, I feel triggered. This is going to be a good session. (laughs) I like it. I like it. I really do see the value in having someone that you're accountable to who can, like you said, challenge you and ask you to just kind of think outside the box. I also find that for a lot of people who run companies or are super busy, sometimes it's hard to put that 90 minutes or an hour just to think and process what's going on and Mm -hmm. having sometimes, not that it's unfortunate, but sometimes having to pay someone to help you do that really gets the job done and make sure you stay committed it to it so yeah. that's what i'm finding as well oh definitely because when you pay for it you can't blow it off you can't right say, it's kind of like, like a it. personal trainer <laughs> <laughs> literally it's literally like a personal <laughs> trainer so. yes definitely definitely well i love it i mean so many women have come on here and talked about the importance of getting help and i'm just glad you're reiterating it here because a lot of people they look at you they look at me look at other people and they think we're super women and that's mm-hmm. not the case we're not doing this by ourselves or else we would go crazy. (laughs) No, I agree. That was what I learned in my last coaching session when we talked about fears. My coach really helped me to unpack my fears because she was like, people would look at you and think you're fearless given what you've accomplished. But I have a fear sometimes of making decisions. I have a fear of making the wrong decisions or not getting things right. And she really helped me to unpack that and think of ways that that's holding me back. And Mm -hmm. I only share that because We all have fears, if you will. And it's just nice to know that you're not the only one that feels that way. Oh, yeah, definitely. And as you get more successful, more of your fears come out. Because the first fear I think we have in business is, am I going to make any money? You know, are people going to buy what I have to offer? You know, is this going to work? And then you start making money and you're like, okay, I'm going to be successful, you know, and there's a fear of success that comes up. Like, what if people think I change? So... It's really interesting how our fears pop up at different times. Agreed. Yeah. Cool. Well, I can't let you go without giving us a book recommendation. We have an ongoing Happy Black Woman book list from all of our podcast guests. Oh, my goodness. Is there a book that has inspired you in your journey? Well, I'm reading something now that's been really helpful. I'm going to give you two. One that I'm reading and one that I want to read next. The one I'm reading now is Essentialism, The Art of Doing Less. Mm. And I like it because it just talks about strategies to increase your productivity while cutting back on some of the fat in our lives, whether it's meetings, whether it's commitments, whether it's telephone calls, what have you. And like you mentioned us, you know, a lot of us are overachievers. One of the, the, the lines of the book that stood out to me the most was sometime for an o- overachiever, the hardest thing to do is to do nothing. Yep. Meaning just think, <laughs> just think, just sit still. Yeah. Don't do so. And sometimes doing nothing, there's more ROI or return on investment of doing nothing versus taking that extra meeting. You get Mm -hmm, what I'm saying? mm -hmm. That hour of spent just thinking or meditating or praying or whatever, spending it on yourself, you may get more mileage out of that than you may get out of going to an hour long meeting. And so I really like that. And then the next book I want to read is The Art of Tidying Up or yeah, I think it's called The Art of Tidying Up Mm -hmm. and just kind of how decluttering your life and minimizing certain kind of, you know, excess may help you better again to become more productive. So those are the two that are on my hit list right now. Hmm. Beautiful. That's the Marie Kondo book, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. I love to get insight on what's inspiring our entrepreneurs. And I don't think we've heard of the first book on the list. So we'll put that in the show notes as well. And finally, before you go, Christia, if there was one piece of advice you could give to our women who are looking at your success and thinking, wow, that would be great. But could I really do that? And they really just need that push to actually dive in, go for it, get started. What would you tell them knowing what you know now? I would just say step into your greatness. A lot of the things that are preventing us from being great are mental. And like I said, from the very beginning, despite all that I accomplished and even all that I hope to accomplish, I did not know what I was doing at the very beginning of this journey. And there are even times, a lot of times now, as I look to what else I want to accomplish, I don't even know how to get there. But the point is, you just have to step into your greatness, own it and get out of your head and just say, I'm going to do it and start. 
Mm-hmm. Beautiful advice. Thank you so much, Christia. And for those who want to stay in touch with you and connect with you after listening to all your wisdom today, how can they do that? Sure. So the best way to get in touch with me is to follow me on Instagram. I'm at TGINCEO, or you can follow us at TGI Natural. And the website of the company is www.tginatural.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure. Well, it was great talking to you as well. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right, ladies. Well, that was Christia Donaldson, founder of Thank God It's Natural. And I hope you enjoyed that interview. Make sure you go to the show notes on our website at happyblackwoman.com slash podcast. And you can get all the resources that she shared. And while you're there, you can go and listen to all of our other podcast episodes from other women who were really sharing generously from the heart about their journey and how it can inspire you. Until next time, have a beautiful day, everybody. I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on the Happy Black Woman podcast. If you want all the show's notes from today's episode, go to happyblackwomanpodcast.com. Plus, we'll send you a copy of Rosetta's free life mapping workbook. We look forward to empowering you next time. And until then, do something this week that makes you happy.